Welcome to the Nonprofit Council Podcast, a podcast that provides everything you need to start and lead a nonprofit organization that will change the world. We understand that starting a nonprofit can be overwhelming, and that's why we're here to shortcut the learning curve for you. Our expert guests will share their knowledge and experience to help you avoid common mistakes and set your organization up for success. So tune in to the Nonprofit Council podcast and let us help you turn your passion into a thriving nonprofit organization. Now your host, May Harris. Welcome to the Nonprofit Council podcast. Today, my guest is Ryan Ponsford, who is the co-founder of, let me get it right, Gateway for Good, which is a for-profit organization um, headquartered in Delaware, a public benefit corporation that really serves the sector, as well as the founder of a nonprofit called Main Street Philanthropy. Welcome to the Nonprofit Council podcast, Ryan. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Well, we were discussing kind of before we started on the podcast that we, this is the first time we've really truly been introduced, but I loved reading more information about how you kind of got into the nonprofit sector. And one thing that really struck me is something I've heard again and again, which is your first experience was kind of because it was required. Maybe you can tell me a little bit about that experience. Yeah, good question. I'm, this might be common for people, but at the time I was working in the financial services space, I was in private banking, and one of the recommendations was to get involved with a nonprofit board. Now, I think the the secret purpose was they thought that you know other people of wealth were at nonprofits, and so it would be a way to get clients. Um, I'm not a big fan of that reason for doing things. So, but I complied and I got pulled onto a nonprofit board um, in the arts and culture space. And it's a space I, I do love, I do enjoy, um, but it was a very unusual experience. It was my first. And I probably sat on that board for close to a year before I ever got brave enough to really ask questions. And uh, what that is a thing very like, common <laughs> thing I hear. Yeah. Very common. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, they kind of had this way of doing things that to me didn't make sense. But I also assumed I was new to this. I was young. Um, I was from the financial space and none of the finances made sense to me. But I just assumed that was my misunderstanding. And they would, they seemed to pass budgets and approve things that didn't mathematically make sense. And so I kind of just kept my mouth shut. Um, then finally, a while later, I got brave and raised my hand and asked a question and the room kind of went silent. I got some looks like you're not supposed to ask that question. Um, and then eventually found out there were actually some kind of big issues happening there that we then needed to resolve. And it took some time to work our way through that. Right. And I think a lot of times, you know, it takes, especially when you're young and you've never been on a board before to really like step forward with a question because you don't want to sound like you haven't done your homework. You don't know what you're talking about. But I think actually the majority of the time, you're not the only one sitting in that room with that same question. Was that kind of the experience here too? A hundred percent. And that's life, right? That's, that's every school experience, college experience. Um, you know, I was the guy that kind of sat in the back of the room, assuming my question was the dumb one until I, you know, got more confidence, matured, and then eventually realized that you really don't learn anything without asking questions. And I finally figured out that conversation and question is a great way to learn. And so it did take me a while. Um, and also figured out that actually a lot of people in nonprofit sectors, there's, there's not a lot of, I'll call it training. I don't know if that's the right word for it, but ways for people to know how to evaluate an organization and, you know, look at the financials or, I mean, the tax returns, it's all public information, but most people don't know that where to find them, what to even look for, trying to assess the, you know, what is the functionality of this board? And so it, it can be difficult for people new to this sector or, you know, coming even from a business environment that have been in a long time to even know, you know, what questions to ask? Is it appropriate? You know, some people get easily offended. And so it's just a very different dynamic working in that space. 
Absolutely. And so you, you really mentioned a lot of this is public knowledge anyway. Um, the 990s are public. They're on the IRS website. Um, they, you know, are on Candid or GuideStar, same, same. Um, you know, and they are on a lot of state attorney general's websites. And then you're also supposed to provide a copy to the public when asked. So at the end of the day, this is all public information. Um, so you should be asking questions. You should try to understand them. And, you know, one thing that you said, which is there isn't a lot of training on this kind of thing. Well, there's a lot more than there used to be. Thank goodness for the Internet and a lot of consultants who are doing, you know, really great work in this in this space. So the resources are out there if you look for them. I think, you know, if I were to give any kind of nugget to a new person sitting on a nonprofit board that kind of is feeling you know, gosh, should I answer, should I ask that question or should I raise my hand is if there's any healthy nonprofit board, in my opinion, there's a lot of interaction. There's a lot of questions. There's a lot of give and take, and there's no expectation that someone is, you know, stay silent by any stretch. I think the sign, you know, of an unhealthy board is where the board chair or the executive director does all the talking. Everyone else there is doing the bobbleheaded board thing, which, you know, I'm like, that's the, the worst thing. If you're sitting on a new, if you're a new person sitting on a board like that, let that be a yellow flag. You know, start asking those questions. Start exploring what does this line item mean on our financial statement? Please tell me what's going on here. Don't be afraid to do that because really you have a duty to do it when you really think about it, to, to have that duty of inquiry, right? A hundred percent. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, if no one's going to ask questions, then what do you need those people for? Um, you know, yeah, you they're, have nothing they're to just say, the then, yes men. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Just go home, right? Stop wasting. You're, you are not, you're not investing your time well, nor are you contributing to the success of the thing. We don't need bodies. Um, it's interesting. I, I now, have a, a whole new approach. If I join a board, it's more of a warning to them <laughs> than it is anything. If they, you know, I, I might be interested. I avoid most boards, um, but I will warn. I can't halfway do it. So if I'm gonna join, I'm probably gonna be a real pain for you because I am gonna ask hard questions. I can't help it. I want to understand how it works. I'm gonna push, promote, challenge what you think, challenge the mission. Are we aligned? How are we making decisions? Are they, you know, good, suitable, financially sound decisions? And I can't not do that. And so, you know, sometimes it's a warning. You may not want me part of this board um, because I will probably be a bother to you. Um, so, it, you know, it is interesting as you learn the space and figure out how can you contribute um, and how, you know, not to be dead weight because it's that is, again, not helpful. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I wish there were more individuals like you <laughs> when you're well because you know nonprofits they are always like oh desperate to find that next great board member but i think to your point they should be perfectly clear on what that perfect awesome board member looks like and for organizations that truly want to grow and scale and be effective and impactful in their communities they're going to want board members who do exactly that which is ask questions understand how can i be of assistance how can i push this mission forward and if you don't even know what the mission is and how it's being applied you can't push it forward right true yeah and i've found there's different I'll call it purposes behind boards or motivations behind how boards are designed. You know, there's working boards where they expe expect people on the board to do most of the work for the organization. There's people go find board members because they think they can write big checks uh, or know people that can write big checks. That's one of the most common. And then there's more, you know, strategic guidance and governance boards, which I think is kind of the ultimate purpose of a board, uh, but, there, but there's a wide range of how they actually function and what the organizations are looking for, whether they know it for, or not. So there's a, there is a range of that. And I think that's, what's important to be clear on, you know, it, it, I, I've found, you know, it's because of the number of things that I do, it's hard to be on a working board. You know, I've got enough day jobs and I love providing counsel and guidance. Other people love the working board. They want to go volunteer. They want to get their hands dirty. They want to, you know, show up and do the work. That's great. Just it's important to know what you're getting into as an individual and as a board, know what you're asking and what you're expecting of people. 
because unmet expectations typically lead to unhappiness. <laughs> so, you know, there's a clear correlation there of, of managing expectations along the way. Well, very well taken, because I think in my experience, you know, the working board, it's, it's kind of a question of maturity of an organization. You'll see those working boards when they're young, you know, the first five to 10 years of, of being established, they need people that are working because they haven't built the systems and the management and the this everything that goes into running a nonprofit. And, you know, there's a certain personality type for board members that align to that. You, you, you mentioned that and I 100% agree um, that flourish in that kind of startup, you know, kind of mode. And then there are others, you know, and that really flourish more in the advisory, the governance. Let's meet quarterly and really do a deep dive into these things, not a monthly, let's get the work done kind of thing. But I've seen it really in, you know, maturing organizations. So you have been a founder of a nonprofit. So you've been in that kind of startup phase. Um, so tell me a little bit about why you started. What is it? Main Street? Yeah, Main Street. Main Street Philanthropy. Tell me about um, the genesis of that. So great question, a bit of a story. I'll try and do a, a slightly shortened version of it because it is fascinating. Um, you know, the easy answer is to somewhat started it kicking and screaming. Um, the goal was not to get into the space or start a nonprofit or have another entity. You know, it's not easy to set up. It's not easy to run. Uh, there's plenty of them out there. So, you know, I would always tell people if you can partner with somebody, that's a much easier route than starting one. Um, but really it stemmed from, trying to solve an issue that was more acute and then realizing it was much broader. And um, to go kind of back to the origin, it started, I was working in wealth management and working on families where families transition wealth. And when wealth transfers to kids, kids have a tendency to blow the money and end up hating each other. And it's a real big issue in wealth transition. And to me, the big concern was especially around relationships and families and the fracture that happened around transition of assets or wealth. And I could study what are the characteristics of those that were successful, those that failed. And, but it was really hard to create connection within family members. You know, they needed a vision. They needed kids needed financial literacy and understanding. They needed trust and communication and connection with generations in the family in order for that to work out smoothly. So as I looked around, one of the most powerful tools I found to create connection within families and then realize the broad use of it was around giving. And I realized that I could have families give together and create very unique experiences where they found common ground around causes, things they would love to change about the world if they could. Um, I was able to teach them financial principles around we're not going to donate to organizations, we're going to invest in them, which is where the 990 tax return came into play and how do you analyze those. And then we taught just communication, trust, decision making where they had to agree on decisions they were making. Because you think about it, a lot of people have siblings. And I often ask if you have siblings, how often do you guys have to agree on financial decisions where you share in the outcome? And it's not often. Usually it's when something happens to mom Incredibly or dad. Rare. Which like, Incredibly yeah, rare. Incredibly rare. Which is like emotionally <laughs> charged time when it comes up, right? And so that's what I was working on. Well, in an in a interesting twist of events, I had a friend of mine that was working at a school here in San Diego um, in downtown called McFadder Middle School, which was part of the juvenile court system. It was within San Diego Unified, um, but these were kids that had been kicked out, expelled, I um, just had some challenges in the traditional system. So they were in this alternative school and he just approached me. He wanted to meet up. He had some questions about financial stuff and some insurance and things. So we we're just hanging out, having a conversation and talking about our worlds and our days. And he was talking about this group of kids he was working with. And I was talking about these very affluent families I was working with. And first we thought we're in wildly different worlds. And then as we looked at it, we started realizing, wait a second, there's a lot of common ground here. The kids he was working with had a, a, a lack of purpose, a vision of I can do mindset. They had a big lack of just financial understanding. They'd never been taught financial tools, principles, how to handle money. And a lot of them had very significant challenges with trust and communication within their own families, within their peers. And so we said, well, what if we raise some money and put these kids on the giving side of philanthropy? And what if we changed the script and had them be the ones that gave? They've been beneficiaries of organizations in the past. 
What if we put them on the giving side? Oh, that is so cool. <laughs> what, a, what a unique um, concept. That's amazing. A wild idea. So the, the, so I wrote a bunch of grant requests uh, to try and fund it. They all got declined. So at the time, I thought, well, that was a really dumb idea. Um, but happened to be at an event. I'd spoken at a big family office conference in Florida, flying back, stopped in Albuquerque, New Mexico, randomly. Um, a good friend of mine, both of our mothers had passed away from cancer. And so he was doing a, a gala event fundraiser for cancer. And so I stopped off at that. We're having a conversation. And I happened to sit next to this family at dinner. And somehow this came up. I shared this idea and she said, well, that sounds interesting. Um, you know, how are you going to fund it? I said, I have no idea. I wrote a bunch of grant requests. They all got declined. And she said, we might be interested. Can you send me something? So I didn't have anything. So on the airplane from Albuquerque to San Diego, opened my laptop wrote a 10 week curriculum, sent it off to her. She'd called me that Saturday morning and said, Ryan, this is great. Where do I send a check? And so I have a phrase that uh, comes up a lot and, and pardon my language, but it's, oh crap, they said yes. And so this was a great, uh, oh crap, they said yes moment where the next thing I knew I was, you know, eight weeks in a classroom with my friend, Scott, working with these kids two hours a day, once a week and going through this entire giving experience where we had them identify causes they cared about, put them in groups where they had overlapping causes. Um, they went and evaluated, visited, identified organizations. And at the end, we got in buses, and went and delivered checks. And it was mind blowing. They blogged each week as they went through it. So we got to really ask questions and hear from them what was happening as they were going through this transition and those blogs to this day are some of my favorite writings I've ever read just about their new understanding of the connection they had with their peers. Um, funny, not funny, but interesting side story. Uh, when we set up the groups, we had them choose causes and then we put them in groups with the ones that shared causes. Well, one of the groups had two of the kids were in opposing gangs. And so Scott came and told me this and I said, okay, well, we should probably split them up. You know, I don't need to be in the middle of that. And he said, no, let's leave them together and see what happens. So I was a little bit freaked out, but um, said, okay, let's do it. And it turns out that was one of the highest performing groups in that class. They came together, connected around the cause they cared about and worked together during those eight weeks to go make a difference in that space. And when they left the classroom, they had to go separate ways, couldn't make eye contact because that was the rules of the street. But for those moments, they found connection. That is an amazing story. That, I, seriously, I just have to say that's an amazing story. It, it better Thank not you. end here. It. It better no, not end it here. doesn't. And in this, I mean, it was really this became the catalyst for a couple of things. Um, one is that simple connection opened my eyes to the incredible power of giving. And it really came back to one of the first things we taught in that class is the word philanthropy is terrifying to most people. It's a it's really a very, long word. And I think it's, it's used incorrectly. It's, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's elitist sounding. And, it and if you say, you know, what comes to mind, people think, oh, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and millions of dollars and big checks and names on buildings and tax deductions. Well, we started out with these kids breaking down the word, the two Greek words, phylos, anthropos. We told the story, the original playwright that wrote about Prometheus and, and his description of, of mankind of having this phylos anthropia. And we broke it down. The two words simply are phylos is a word for love, anthropos, humankind. Nothing about money, tax deductions or big checks. If you can love other people, you are capable of becoming a philanthropist. And so it was a very empowering thing for them to now be associated with a philanthropist because they could be one simply by loving or caring others. And that was a big epiphany and eye opener. So the next phase was, OK, this was really neat. Um, worked once. Can it work again? And is this just a fluke thing? So I called another friend of mine who is in Florida and told him the story. And he's just one of these brilliant guys that just is does stuff and has just a deep, wise man. And he said, I'll, I will try this in Florida. So he went and found a class and taught. I had a whole book with the entire curriculum. I had a survey at the beginning and the end to measure results, all these things, blogs, all set up. He went, walked through the same curriculum and got almost identical results as we surveyed the kids. And so now we knew it could be replicated. We knew what the results would be. And it was those, those moments that I'm sure you've had where there's the, there's the things you must do 
And then there's the things you can't not do. And the latter is way worse, right? There's the, I must do this, but then there's the, I can't not do this. And we came to the conclusion, we have to tell people about this and do something with it. And so I spoke at some philanthropy conferences around the country, just telling the story. And we started having people raise their hands and then started putting that program into schools in New Jersey, Florida, uh, Wisconsin, and then here in California. Um, to your earlier point of startup organizations, the biggest barrier to that is it's myself and a couple goofy volunteer working board members building the thing to where I always go back to, you know, if we had, if we took the time to go invest in this thing, get working people to build and grow it, it is probably one of the most powerful outcomes I've seen of teaching people how to give the power of giving to the point where that's actually what led us to launch Gateway for Good was a way to build a for-profit organization that could fund Main Street philanthropy. And our ultimate goal around this whole thing is my belief is giving actually has the power to reunite the divided world that we're in. Um, I think we're in a wildly divided world. And when I look at how do we solve that, what's missing, I think about lack of care, lack of empathy, or lack of love, which is a word that freaks people out. But to me, giving is the action and love is the outcome. Absolutely. So well, when you we when you broke that. down the word philanthropy, it's a lack of philanthropy, really. It Loving is. fellow it man. Is. But I couldn't agree with you more, especially we're heading into an election. Well, we are in an election year. We've got a countdown to an election and, and people are just getting farther and farther away. And how amazing would it be if we could truly align around giving and loving other humans? I mean, it sounds so simple, but so difficult at the same time, doesn't it? It is, you know, simple, not easy, I guess, but um, probably one of the most profound truths that I don't know that people can really disagree with, because I don't think you can give and dislike at the same time. That That's so true. That's so true. So tell me, so you've kind of replicated this in many different states. Um, how How long have you been working on mainstream philanthropy? Now I understand the word, by the way, and the name of the organization, Main Street Philanthropy, you're bringing it to the Main Street. But how long have you been really kind of working on this? Yeah. So, well, naming it was interesting because we really went through some debate of I didn't like the word philanthropy at all because, again, it's got that Again, it's misused feel. and understood. And it, like it, it does have this connotation of elitism, like you're talking about, like big foundations are philanthropists, big, you know, multi-billion dollar people are philanthropists, not someone that you run into at Starbucks, you know? Correct. Yeah. Which is a great misconception. But so we finally concluded, let's go with it in order. Well, let's just take it head on and try and change it. And that we kind of created that oxymoron of Main Street philanthropy in order to force the conversation and create the opportunity to share the difference. Uh, but that so that first experiment, we ended up launching the organization. We tested that in 2012. We launched the organization in 2013. So about 11 years into running Main Street Philanthropy, um, we've done probably a little over 100 classes around the country. Uh, COVID was interesting because that changed a lot of it. Historically, we've gone in in person to classes. And during COVID, it really forced us to step back and we've started digitizing a bunch of it. So we're now in the process. We, we created digital tools in order for people to go through some of the early experiential part of identifying causes they care about and they identify their personal giving strengths. What is it I love to do? How can I make a difference personally, absent of any financial resources? And so we created some digital tools around that that are pretty fun called a social fingerprint index. So we allow people to get their, discover their own social fingerprints. Um, and then we're currently still in the process of recording and digitizing all that content in order to make it much more scalable in classrooms, we've created programs for companies. We're doing work with some service organizations, a lot in that space, but all with that same core premise of how do we provide a simple, meaningful path to giving and giving as a path to create connections. Well, so I love this so much. Um, one 
piece that we kind of didn't focus on that you are also kind of working on. And, and, you know, both of my parents have passed away and they had some funds and we all thought about that. Um, It would have been great if we'd had these conversations, right, (laughs) before when we were growing up. But what are you doing really in that area, too? I mean, it's not really the nonprofit kind of focused, but gosh, it's critical that kind of conversation that you have in families before, because I hate to say it, but sometimes, you know, some of the members of my family, I felt like I was in competing gangs. Like, so to have that connection before, you know, all that, those stresses of having to handle, you know, the wealth that has come to you in a healthy way. If you did that before, tell tell me, I'm so excited to hear what you're doing in this area. Yeah, so there, that's a big space. And so my my real day job is owning a, a wealth consulting firm. And so that's where I originally started out as in private banking, um, helped build a firm that got sold. And so just started doing more consulting type work with families. Um, I still have investment licensing with a with a what I would consider a boutique family office here in Southern California. A lot of the work we do is on the consulting side with families, largely around wealth transition and large around the use of philanthropic tools to create connection. So it tends to be families with businesses, real estate, the, the more illiquid the assets, the more difficult. Um, but at the same time, those same challenges apply to everyone. And so we've done it in our firm. A lot of what I'm doing now is a lot of speaking at conferences, family office conferences, wealth management conferences, because nobody's having these conversations. And the people, in my opinion, that should be are the financial advisors, the estate planning attorneys, and some of those types of professionals that position themselves as risk managers. Um, we help manage the risk of your family and create better outcomes. But what I learned is there's very little conversation around the potential risk of your kids not liking each other or never speaking to each other or blowing 100% of what you've spent your lifetime creating. And, you know, you can talk about investment risk, task, taxes and economics as much as you want. But if you're talking about the probability, you know, 70% chance you lose 100% of your assets and relationships with your kids within a generation or two, that's real. And, and that's a real risk that no one talks about. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I, I Nobody think wants to. No, no. What do you mean my children won't? get along? What do you mean they're going to be spendthrifts and decide to invest in all sorts of really weird, wacky things? Um, yeah, I guess maybe you just don't want to think about it. But I, to your point, the advisors that, you know, these individuals are relying on, it behooves them to actually have that real conversation, right? This is something we need to bring to the surface as painful as it might be. Yeah. The problem is it's hard. Like there, there's, there's not a real proven business model for it. Um, and again, that was part of what made me start doing philanthropy with families. And this is sort of a funny side story around a family that was kind of the impetus for this. And it was a similar conversation where they, it was a, they had a one child. So it's way more complicated if you have multiple, but they were concerned about the impact the wealth was going to have on their child. And so I started talking to them around, okay, there's some things we can do. Let's help get him prepared for what it's going to look like. How does he make sure he's, there's good transition. He can make good financial decisions. He's surrounded by, you know, people to give him good advice, et cetera. And it came down to, you know, okay, well, what's that going to cost to have you help me with that? And I'd gone through an exercise with them around, you know, what's most important to you in life. And that's one of the first conversations I asked people. And it blew my mind the first time because I'm in the financial space and I make really cool spreadsheets, right? And I'm like, it's got to be, you know, standard deviations and tax rates and all that stuff. And that never makes the list. It's, you know, my family, my kids, my faith, security, health, making an impact, making a difference. Those are the things that people really care about. And in the financial industry, we don't talk about that. We, we, we don't position your financial resources as a tool to simply allow you to live the life you want under the principles you want to live. And so for this family, he started asking those questions. I said, well, let's talk about it. You know, you, you mentioned that this is the, in their case, the second most important thing. Faith was on the top of their list. Their family and all that was, was second on their list as because I make them prioritize. And your, your money management isn't even on the list. So let's assume it's lower than 10. 
This is a pretty well-to-do family. So I, you know, let's assume you're paying your money managers a million dollars a year to manage all of your stuff. And it could be a hundred thousand a year, whatever the number is. So if that's 10 or below, and this is two, then is it safe to say we should be able to charge at least that amount in order to fix this problem? And, you know, he laughed. Oh, it sounds like a lot of money. Go, yeah, it does. But it's that important, right? Well, yeah, it is, but I'm not sure. And then he asked a great question, which is, well, how do I know if it's going to work? And that really got me as an interesting thought because, you know, you're, you're tiptoeing into therapy when you're doing some of this stuff. And the best answer I came up with was call me in three generations and I'll let you know if you're, how your great grandkids are doing. Right. And so, you know, joking, of course, but it came down to that realization that this process of working with families these ways is takes a lot of time, um, which is difficult to bill for. It takes it's you have to really have a an emotional IQ to answer and ask these types of questions with people, which is a commitment. Um, and then how do you build charge for it? And how do you know if it's going to work? And a lot of that was what caused me to create what turned into the Main Street Philanthropy Curriculum. Because I figured out that I could use philanthropy to teach so many of those principles without it being directly about the family. So I looked at, you know, a family having a shared mission, vision, and purpose is a huge part of them being successful. If we see each other in our lives in the future, we're far more likely to resolve problems today, right? Versus if, you know, if I cut you off on the freeway tomorrow, you're probably not too worried about maintaining that relationship. You might say some things you might otherwise say than if I knew I was going to see you at Thanksgiving, right? And so that vision is important. Financial literacy is important. And then just trust and communication. Can we appreciate each other? And I learned that the philanthropic process taught that. And I could create a program that I had a beginning, had an end, and I could objectively measure the results. Do you know what really strikes me is you've got these two, you know, you've got this philanthropy, this nonprofit, you know, curriculum that you're, that you're working on and doing some amazing things here. And then you've got this for-profit that's really going into families and, and asking those tough questions. And it really occurred to me, really, you're asking one question, but it doesn't matter who you're asking it. And that's like, think about what really matters to you. What can we connect on together in a way that's, that goes above and beyond money or above and beyond the gangs or above and beyond the, the struggles that you're having on a day-to-day basis. You're asking the same question, just in a very different setting. Right. Um, and I think, I think that's the real struggle people, you know, especially when they bring on advisors, I, you know, I, I'm in the same space. They just want the answers and they want to move on and, you know, fix me, tell me where to go, go here, but you can't really do that competently, I guess, in my opinion, if you don't know what they really care about, what, what is it that, you know, is the most important thing to you going forward? And I, I think it's so amazing how you have found two different ways and two different avenues where you're really asking the same question and you're making a significant impact in both of those. So well done. I appreciate that. Thank you. It's, I mean, it it is interesting. People get confused. You do all these things. Not really. To your point, it all boils down to One thing. <laughs> asking a question. Yeah. What right. is the thing? And, and it's, it's not really all that complicated at the end. You know, we always say that, you know, answers are easy. Anybody can give you the answers they think you want and sell you a thing that you think you want. The challenge is, do you ask good questions and get people to think about it a little differently? And now that, to your point, if you want to provide good counsel without knowing that, how do you even begin? Um, I could you never just float on the surface. You're that. just floating yeah. on the surface. Right. Right. And yeah. And that works for a lot of people. Um, it does. It does. I, I never found that to work for me. And so no, this is me this either. Is up. I, I actually think it's because I'm a little too curious. I'm like, well, why, why would you want to do that? Why, why, why is that important to you again? And once I fully understand that, then I can advise you a heck of a lot better. Um, but you, you've put it in a way that really makes a lot of sense. Um, so is there anything else, um, that you would like to kind of, uh, let our, our listeners know the, uh, another nugget or something that you think is really important to share? You know, I just think the big thing, you know, with all that's going on, you mentioned election cycle and all that type of stuff. And it's so easy to get caught up in all the noise. And, you know, to me, technology has become this even increasingly divided thing because you look up something 
and you get more feeds on that one thing and it drags you farther down a rabbit hole. It's never to pull people together. It's always to pull them deeper away. And to make judgments. Oh. And judge and, and yeah. not listen and not care. And I, the biggest thing I wish people could hear is the importance of caring, listening. And if you're you know not sure how to do that, or even people that just aren't feeling good or depressed or whatever it is, do something for somebody else. That I believe that feelings follow actions. Feelings follow actions. There's a lot of things we don't feel like doing and we act first, your feelings will follow. Um, simple thing is going to the gym, right? How often do you wake up and feel like going to the gym, right? Almost never until you cross that threshold and you're one of those people that must go, right? But until then, you have to force yourself to take action. But when you're done, you feel great. You're happy you did. And then the next day, you don't feel like it again. So you have to take action, do it again. It, relationships can be similar. Somebody can offend you, hurt your feelings, you know, could be a spouse or someone you care about. And you want to be mean to them because they hurt you, or offended you. But if you're nice or do something kind, your feelings will follow. And I think the biggest encouragement is start somewhere, do something nice, like just try to give. And I think if you give, if that's the action, I think care, love, empathy will be the outcome. And that's probably my biggest encouragement for people is find a way to get started. Um, if you don't know where, there's so many good resources and we provide a lot of that. I know you do stuff in the space. So there's, there's tools and resources for people that want to know, how do I begin? What can I do? I want to start. How do we reunite this crazily divided world? Because um, there's arguably no more important thing happening. Right. Well, just bringing it to intention, right? I loved your gym analogy. It's like, make it a habit. Make that connection and that understanding that you're right, technology right now, it's almost designed to pull you apart and to not have that connection. So you have to intentionally bring it back, the importance of that. Well, thank you so much, Ryan, for being a guest on the Nonprofit Council podcast. It's been really amazing to have this conversation with you. Thank you, man. I appreciate you. This was a lot of fun and um, I'm sure we'll get to chat again. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Nonprofit Council podcast. For more information and to continue the conversation, head over to nonprofitcouncil.com and sign up for our newsletter. Until next time.